How are you guys going? Yes, everybody awake this morning? Yes, it's nine o'clock. We have the whole day ahead of us. That's great. Let's stand up. Why don't you take also just take a second and if you see somebody you haven't met before, maybe just say hi. We're happy to have you here today. Join the day with us. Just love on each other. Yes. So I thought to start this morning by just doing a declaration of what we believe. So we're going to just just glorify God for what He's done, for who He is. And we're doing this with a song called this, The Queen. You guys might know well, but let's just go into a time of just acknowledging our God and acknowledging our faith. You ready?
the saints communion and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son Please be seated. Actually, before you be, get seated, just before you get seated, give the person next to you a high five and then you can sit down. A very warm welcome to, to everyone. It's, a, it's an early start. It's an early start for, for most of us. Um, Double services. Isn't God good? Double services today. So for those who don't know me, my name is Michael. And a very warm welcome uh, to all of you and uh, to all those uh, watching us on live stream. Uh, please say hi to uh, uh, Jordan, who is hosting the live stream uh, today. Now, uh, I just have a couple of family news to share with you. But we're, we're going to share it with you in a different way. Usually, you know, that I would share the news with you. But we've got someone else sharing the family news today. So please cast your eyes towards the screens. Good morning, church. It is so good to have you here with us this morning. My name is Jordy. And I'm Annie. And we are bringing you the family news this morning virtually, which is really exciting. Uh, first of all, we have our GTM and Alpha courses starting this week. So GTM starting on Tuesday from 7 till 9.30 and Alpha is starting on Wednesday also from 7 till 9.30. So if you are interested in these two courses, make sure you register on the website and we will see you there. We also have our baptism classes on the 15th of April and our baptisms on the 28th of April. So if you're interested in doing a baptism class or getting baptized, please book for those. Um, we also have Y and Y on the 21st of April, so get keen for that. Um, Jordan's actually preaching, so get excited and we'd love to see you all there. Hold on, Jordan and Annie. I have a quick announcement to make before you go any further. All of you that have your kids in kids' church right now, you have to pick them up somewhere different today. So come, follow me, let me show you. Let's go on a journey. Come along, children. Keep coming. Come on, don't be shy. Come on. I hope your day's been good. I hope the person next to you doesn't smell too bad. Don't look at them right now. Don't look at them. Don't look at them. So, if we come all the way down here, come on, come on, little ones. This is where you'll be picking up your little ones after the service. So come outside the church, get some fresh air, pick up your little ones from this door here. Back to you, Jordan and Annie. And lastly, we just want to thank all of you who give and partner with us in our vision and mission that we have here at Berwick. And if you would like to partner with us, uh, we have the details on the screen now. And yeah, that's pretty much it. We will see you all next week. Hey, how was that? So, just a couple of things. Um, 
didn't that turtle look just a little bit like Jordan? <laughs> um, and remember that the, that the kids are getting picked up uh, at a different spot from, from today. Um, and, you know, after the service, we're going to have coffee. But, but remember, remember this when you leave today, K before K, okay? K before K. Kids before coffee. Don't forget about your kids before you, before you have coffee. Kids before coffee. Don't get it the wrong way around. Kids before coffee. Why don't we all stand and let's continue to worship God. Yes. So before we start, I'm just going to read this scripture. Psalm 34. Now we've done this song a few times called Taste and See, but I just thought to read the scripture that goes with this. It's just so powerful. Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord, listen to this, encamps around those who fear him, those who worship him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you holy people. For those who fear Him, those who worship Him, lack nothing. How good is that? How good is that? Yes. So we're going to stand on that truth today. And we're going to declare it together. You ready? I saw the Lord And He answered me And delivered me, delivered me from every fear, those who look on him are radiant. They'll never be ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. This poor mankind. Thank you. 
Shit and cry.
Father, we we join all the saints, all the angels, all the elders, as they declare, you are worthy of it all. Lord, we join every church this morning every believer every person worshiping you today around the world the millions the billions of people and we declare lord that you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all you are jesus you are worthy of it all lord and we just want to worship you this morning in jesus name we pray Please be seated, everyone. So we now come to the part of our service uh, where we worship um, our Lord, God, Savior, and King uh, by sharing in the Lord's Supper. If you don't have the elements, could you push, uh, please put your hands up, sir? Uh, our helpers can can give you some of the elements. That's great. Fantastic. All right. Okay. Oop, I better have mine. So, if you can get your elements ready by peeling off the plastic film so you can get to the um, to the wafer, to the bread and then peel off the foil so you can get to the juice but hold on to it because I want us to um, eat and drink together All right. now um, I was having a, a chat with, with someone uh, during the week about how would it, it would have felt to experience the Red Sea parting. Yeah, imagine if you were there. Imagine if you were there. You know, the, the, um, the Egyptians uh, were, were chasing the Israelites. And God supernaturally, supernaturally splits the Red Sea. And they walked through. And were rescued from the Egyptians. God supernaturally um, saved them. The Bible talks about how the people responded. That the people were in reverent awe before God. And, and trusted in God and his servant Moses. The people were in reverent awe before God. And trusted in God and his servant Moses. And as we share in the Lord's Supper this morning. I know, I know that our minds are probably being chased or our minds are chasing you know the urgent needs in life but but let me invite you to to pause and just think about the supernatural gift of salvation that God offers and gives us and let us respond in in awe and in worship let, let me read to you this the communion passage um, using the message version so this is quite interesting 1 Corinthians 11 The master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took the bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, Remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. 
you will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. So you must not let familiar, familiarity breed contempt. And then it keeps going. It says, anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be a part of? And the passage keeps going. It says, examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. So I invite you, examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal, the Lord's Supper, in holy awe. Let us eat and drink together. Father, we, we thank you for the opportunity to share um, in this supper. Help us, Lord, to examine our hearts, to test our motives, and to respond to you in holy, holy awe and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, we have a, a, a guest speaker today. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about him. Um, so, he's quite he's renowned, world-renowned in the area of worship. He's created courses that help you become a better worshiper. He's, he's written books about worship. He's recorded a live uh, worship album and a, and a DVD. Um, he was part of a church in South Africa that grew from, from, um, from 80 people to 10,000 people. And then um, that's when he left. Uh, sorry. No, when he left, it was actually at 15,000. And then more recently, they're now at 30,000. So with all these achievements, the one thing that, that clearly came, came across to me when I, was, when I spent some time with him was that with all of these achievements, this person is still very humble. And I hope that, that what I saw, will, 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 you will see as well as he you know, teaches us or, or as God speaks to us through him, uh, about what, what God wants us to tell through him. So, can we give a very warm, Beric welcome to Pastor Tom Inglis. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Michael. Bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to be here. You're glad to be in the house of the Lord? Yes. Pastor Michael, uh, I'm sticking with you because... Uh, after, when he picked me up from the airport, he says, are you hungry? And I said, yeah, I'm quite hungry. He said, well, we'll, we'll find a good place to eat. And boy, he found, he found a great place. So I'm sticking with you, Pastor. <clears throat> You're my man. Forget the rest. You're my man. <laughs> All right, so this is, a, this is a Scottish accent, in case you don't know. Um, God speaks to me in a Scottish accent. You thought he was Australian, but he's actually Scottish. And uh, so I married a South African. We have uh, four children and eight grandchildren 
And so they keep us busy. Most of them are living in and around us in Sydney. Thank you, Pastor. And so, uh, so it's a real privilege to be with you. I really didn't know anything about the church, but uh, I thank uh, Pastor, Pastor Bram and the, uh, the leadership team for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you. It actually worked out good for me because uh, tomorrow I fly to Singapore and I'm doing some ministry up there for a couple of weeks and then across to Indonesia and I got there quite regularly. So this is good. It's a good place to fly from. It's the same time from here to Singapore as it is from Sydney to Singapore. You would think it'd be quicker. It'd be longer, but it's the same time. Anyway, praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Amen. And so um, I want to just tell you a funny story that happened. I was telling some of the worship team, we did a worship conference this weekend. And, uh, you know, I've got, I've got, you know, these eight grandkids and they keep us pretty busy. And uh, oh, I see Judy's there. God bless you, Judy. And, uh, and so Thursday evening, I'm, I'm just kind of resting. I'm reading a little bit. I'm in my study. And my, one of my sons phones me. And uh, we have this group thing, you know, the family group thing. So if one phones, everybody can speak to you. So, so Andrew phones me and he's lying in bed, you know, with his, my grandson, who's four and a half. And uh, <clears throat> so Andrew says, uh, Papa, uh, Jagger has got a question for you before he goes to sleep. And he says, Papa, he needs an answer tonight. So I says, okay, so I hit the button and then all of a sudden the whole family's on there, you know. We all the grandkids and <laughs> the spouses and my, my daughters and my, you know, it was crazy. So I had a whole audience. So I'm thinking this is going to be good because, you know, I'm used to seminars and questions and answers and all this kind of stuff. And I usually do okay at, with those, you know. So, uh, so uh, Jagger, Jagger said, uh, Papa, the question I have for you does the Holy Spirit have legs? And, and I, I was like, what? So, so I'm thinking, man, you know, I, I didn't know how to answer. Now, my daughter is a pastor. I, I handed over my church to her and she's the pastor. So I'm stuck, you know, I'm thinking, you know, how do I, does the Holy Spirit have legs? So I kind of tried to move. I says, well, you know, we know that God the Father has a face and, and God the Father has legs and, and he has hands. And he says, he says, Papa, does the Holy Spirit have legs? And I says, well, I'm not, I'm not really too sure about that. So I was a little bit stuck. But uh, he's a little bit into the Holy Spirit at the moment. You know, I took him for a walk and there's this park close to us and they dedicated the park to a little boy who had passed away. And uh, so we're, we're leaving the park and he sees this little photograph that they had put up of this little boy and he said to me, who's that little boy? And I said, oh, this little boy, you know, um, he, uh, he died and, and, uh, and Jesus took him to heaven and I'm, I'm holding his hand. And he stops me and he says, no, Papa. No, Papa, it, Jesus didn't take him to heaven. I says, uh, who took him to heaven? He says, the Holy Spirit took him to heaven. <laughs> so I phoned my son. I says, what's the deal with the, with the Holy Spirit? He's really big on the Holy Spirit at the moment. He says, Dad, at Children's Church, they've been teaching on the Holy Spirit. So it's a really big thing in his life at the moment. It's all the Holy Spirit or nothing. So that's what you got to get through as a, as a, as a papa. you got to get through all these questions that in 40 years of ministry, nobody has ever, nobody has ever asked me that question in 40 years of ministry. It took my grandson to to stump me. Anyway, praise the Lord. I want to speak this morning and uh, I want to speak on basically how much, how much God loves you. I'm going to keep this really simple this morning, but how much God loves you. I want to give you some insight because, you know, we, we are called to, to worship God and have intimacy with God. And I believe that, oh, by the way, I've got two books with me. I meant to bring them up to show you them, but there's two books. Uh, there's one on worship and healing. There's a strong connection between worship and healing. So I wrote this book on it. And, uh, and so when you simply get into the, the routine of, of knowing what it is to worship, to give thanks, to praise, and to worship God, you'll start to see the connection in that book between worship and healing. And uh, that one is available there today. And then the other one is uh, a prophetic uh, word that I got many years ago about what the church would look like in the end times. And uh, the church is going to be totally glorious. How many believe that? The church is glorious, but it's going to get more glorious. 
Can I get an enthusiastic amen? Amen. God's going to do things in the church that we've never dreamt possible. Our churches will be far too small because of the influx of people. Now, I believe that you're a growing church, and that's great to see that. That's prophetic. That is part of what God is doing all over the world at the moment. There is churches that are alive. People are attracted to them. And I saw this, you know, almost 40 years ago. I had a prophetic word when our church was growing in South Africa. But... Um, What God showed me was that it would be the presence of God that would attract people to the church. It wouldn't be because of any great speakers, but it would be, or any great pastors or anybody like that. It would be the presence of God that will be such a strong presence in our meetings that people from the outside who don't know Jesus will be attracted to the church because of his presence. And the Lord said to me, if I can't attract him, then nobody can. Amen? Amen. So we're going to start to see incredible things taking place in the church. Some of these things, as I travel the world, some of these things are happening already. We see the very beginning of this great, I believe it's a great end time move of God. Um, And it's, it's time for the church because the world has gone crazy. Have you noticed how crazy the world is? Uh, and so, you know, so at the same time, the church will not be taken by surprise. In the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of all this stuff that's going on, in the midst of that, God says, I will build my church. Until the day that Jesus comes back for all of us and we're raptured, then uh, God is going to be building his church right up until the last day. So although there's an acceleration of darkness in the world, there's an acceleration of the Holy Spirit in the church. And that's exciting for all of us because all of us are going to be used. You know... I need to get on onto my subject, but sometimes when I'm on a roll, I just keep going. But, um, but you know that, you know, often think about it like this, that if, if Jesus is coming back soon, and I believe that he is coming back soon, then you and I could be the last generation before he comes back. You ever thought about that? If, if, if we believe that he's coming back soon, which I believe he is, then he's left the generation that he comes back for to be the most powerful, the most anointed generation that the church world has ever seen. That means that you and I are going to be empowered in such an incredible way by the Holy Spirit to lay hands in the sick and we will see them recover. A little more enthusiasm would be great. Amen. We will, you'll have to get used to me, you know what I'm saying? So don't overdo it, keep some for later. (laughs) But, but we're, we're, going to see, we're going to see this stuff start to happen. We're going to see families that's unsaved just quickly like that. People we've been praying for for many, many years. We're going to start to see them taking an interest in the church and asking to come to church. And so one of the things that God showed me way back then, I had an encounter for about 40 minutes in my room. And God, you know, this is how the whole worship thing started, which God took me, you know, into many, many nations and preached in many, many churches. But God said to me, the the end time church will be a worshiping church. I will come back for a people who are passionate about me. Not people who are lukewarm, but people who are absolutely passionate for me. We need passion in the church, hallelujah. Amen, we need to be on fire in the church. We need to be empowered in the church to lay hands in the sick and we see them recover. We need to be empowered and bold in the church to speak to people that don't know Jesus and tell them who he is, amen. So all of this, we're gearing up for all of this and I believe that we are the the generation that's gonna see that come to pass. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. So the point is, what I wanna get to is this, is how much God loves you this morning. How much God loves you this morning. I wanna go to Romans chapter, um, Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight has been, it's been said that it is Paul's, the Apostle Paul's masterpiece. It is by some. Most commentators would say it's the greatest piece of work that he wrote, Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, or in, in Romans, in chapter 8 is the pinnacle of that entire book. And it's just incredible what's in there. So, you know, I want to read something to you here because this is the time that we're living in where a lot of people will start to wonder start to question, where is God? When we see all this darkness come upon the world and the, uh, the stuff that is the persecution that is coming against the church, 
I mean, for us living in, in Australia, we've, uh, we've got it pretty good, to be honest with you. But there's a lot of uh, countries, some cu countries I go to, where there's, there's great persecution. And to be a Christian, you've really got to trust God every day for survival. But uh, there's going to come a time when the persecution verbally is going to intensify against the body of Christ worldwide. And so we've got to be very, very strong. I believe that the church right now is in a place of great preparation, great preparation for that time that's coming. And, and I, I trust that this next few minutes, I can share some of these scriptures that will encourage you. So having said that Romans is, is probably the greatest work of, of Paul, and Romans chapter eight is probably the pinnacle of the greatest work of Paul. Um, this is what he says here. Um, and we're gonna read, I'm gonna read to you from verse 28. It says, and we know, and we know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, that's the point I wanna make is, you know, when stuff is going on in our lives, it doesn't always seem, it doesn't always appear that all things are gonna work out for the good. You know what I'm saying? You can sometimes start to wonder, okay, well, in the midst of this stuff that's going on, I'm, I'm carrying this sickness, for example, or I've got problems in my family, or I've got financial problems. How in the midst of all of that is everything gonna work out for the good? It's an important question, and we have to know how to answer that and how God answers that, because God has already given us the answer for every, every problem that will come up. And so it goes on here, and it says, for whom he, and there's, there's key words I'm going to highlight here. So he's given us an answer that all things will work out for the good. Then he explains to us how we can be sure of that. Because the, the answer to how all things are going to work out for our good is basically explained in the next few verses. And he says this, he says, for, for whom he foreknew, that's number one, he also predestined, number two, to be conformed to the image of, this, of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestinated three, those he called four, and those he called, he justified five, and those he justified, he glorified. So he's, he's basically saying to the church, you're gonna get through a lot of stuff, but I wanna tell you something that I have gone through the stuff to equip you so that you can get through that stuff. Can I get an amen for that? In other words, whatever you're gonna go through, God has already equipped you to get through it. Amen? Now let me just highlight some of these words. So the first thing he says there is, he says, he says before the beginning, beginning of time, before you were ever born, I actually foreknew you. That's the first thing he highlights there. I foreknew you. That means that he knew you before time began. This is amazing. That, that God has always known you. You've, you've never been, you were, when you get born, you were not a stranger to God. It wasn't like God said to the Holy Spirit, you know, who is this person? You know, I wonder what they're going to be like. God actually has foreknown you throughout all eternity past. So you've never actually been outside the mind of God in eternity past. It's a good place to say amen. Amen. You've always been known by God. God knew everything about you before you were born and God knows everything that you're gonna get through as you walk through this life. It's just an incredible, uh, an incredible reality. So he foreknew you. So God doesn't love you based on current information. God has always loved you from the beginning of time up until this point. So it's not like, you know, does God love me? God has always loved you. Amen. And the whole point of worship is God is saying, because I've always loved you, then I want you to experience that love that I have for you intimately. And basically that's what we call worship. I want you to experience the love that I've had from eternity past. Can you imagine how excited God actually got, you know, because God has been thinking about you forever. And then God knew exactly when to bring you onto the earth for you to be born. You weren't born by chance. You were born at exactly the right time that God had pre-planned for you. Can you imagine the excitement? Because God was saying, 
I have been thinking about Tom forever, and now Tom has been born, and now I know the potential that Tom has got to glorify me, and I know exactly the potential that Tom has got to actually be intimate with me, to get to know me really, really well. So, you know, from God's point of view, you are pretty exciting to God. I'd love some more enthusiasm there. I thought that was good. Okay, keep it. So the next thing he says is, he says, I've predestined you. In other words, he knew you beforehand. He knew exactly everything about your present and your future. He knows all of that. We'll go quickly. The third thing here is, I remember I preached this once in my church and my wife actually got excited, which was good, you know, when your wife gets excited at your preaching, it's pretty good, you know. She actually cried out, you know, which, was, ooh, that was good. So, so and it was, it was this point here called, that God called you. God called you in eternity past. God called you. What my wife got excited about was this, that that word called means that God shouted you out by name. Sometime in eternity past, God actually shouted out. The word is not whispered. The word is he shouted out your name. So your name has been known in eternity past forever. Yeah, okay. When, that's good, that's good. Don't overdo it. I'm coming back to this side because I feel there's an anointing on this side. I'm not sure about these guys on the, oh, well, there we go, that's good. Okay, so, so, so but that, that word called is interesting because, because what, you know, when you call someone, it means that you actually want them to come to you. Is that right? When you call your dog, <laughs> I wish my dog would have come every time I called it, you know. <laughs> I get tired calling it. My, my children said, Dad, we should have taught it when it was young. It's too late now, you know. But you, know, you call the dog and it doesn't come. It just ignores you, you know. It's frustrating. But that word actually means that God actually wanted you specially to come to him. He called you out basically for fellowship. The next thing the word means is this, or the next thing that he spells out there is this, that he justified you. This is a legal term. You know, in other words, God says, you've been examined. The evidence against you is null and void. You are innocent. You stand before me as a child of God righteous. Hallelujah. You know, the last, the last point there before we move on is the word glorified. The word glorified. This is an inter interesting word. There's so, much, there's so much spoken about glory. And uh, I remember I went to London. I was speaking in London. And I said to my wife before I went, I said, I'm going to go a week beforehand and take a little apartment somewhere just, you know, um, close to one of the parks, Hyde Park. And, uh, you know, God is speaking to me about glory. And I want to understand that, you know, whole thing about glory. This was about 30 years ago. So uh, she said, okay, that's fine. And, and so I went and I started studying that word, the whole thing on glory. And today, you know, we, we have a lot of talk about the glory of God. And so, sometimes I don't think we have the fullness, the full understanding of it. I'm not saying that I do, but I, I bring a slightly different perspective to what I think a lot of people bring. The glory today for a lot of people is some supernatural manifestation that happens. In a lot of churches, it's, you know, you get the glory cloud coming in. I've actually experienced once the glory cloud when I was leading worship in South Africa. It was a very real thing. It was incredible. Um, so I've, I have experienced that, but it hasn't been common. But the, the glory of God actually means that, that your life will reflect his life. And that's how you reveal God's glory. It's not a supernatural event that comes and goes. It can be that. But the higher level of the glory of God is, and, and Jesus actually in John 17 verse 4, he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you gave me to do. This is an interesting scripture. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you gave me to do. Actually, in the Greek, it says, I have finished or completed or perfected the work that you gave me to do among men. So the glorification process is actually fulfilling your God-given destiny that is going to impact people around you. And the first place of impact is your family.
come on, man. If you don't get it right at home, you don't get it right in the world. Forget about trying to win Africa for Jesus if you don't get your family right. Is anybody here? That's good. Just making sure. So, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, met some, I mean, let's go to Africa and win souls. For, but what about the family, man? The family's in a mess. Your relationship with your wife is not good. Your relationship with your kids is not good. Why would you go and, you, the first place of evangelism is basically in the home. Okay. Amen. It's still quiet over here. It's just a thing. It's the wrong thing. You know, I think you guys must anoint these chairs a little more, you know? You know, so we get even balance here because those guys are anointed, but here it's a little bit unsure. So, so the glorification process, I'm just kidding. You know I'm kidding, right? So the glorification process is basically you discovering what is it that God has given you to do and you simply do it. And when you do what God has called you to do, what happens is that people actually see him through you. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, glorification. Um, so God loves you an awful lot. Now, let me, uh, let me, just, let me just explain this to you. Um, I love this whole concept, and I'm going to keep this simple, is God loves you so much that he actually has shown, he's shown us how valuable you actually are to him. It's incredible to think about this, the value that God places on a human soul. It's really incredible. Every soul is valuable to God. But in Genesis 1.1, now I won't ask you to go there in case you can't find it. No, I'm just kidding. No, that was a joke. Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is that what it says? Yep. In, in the beginning, God created. That word created is a very special word. It is the word bara in the Hebrew. It is, the commentators say, it is not a word that is thrown around by God. It is a very special word. It is a special meaning. So when God talks about when God created the heavens and the earth, the heavens and the earth, it means it was a one-off production. It actually means that there is no other earth like this one. You know, spending a fortune, man, trying to find people that live out there in space. Man, read Genesis 1.1 and, get, you know, get a... Get a Hebrew concordance and you'll find that you're wasting your time. There is no other world out there. Amen. This is it. Amen. This is the, this is the planet that Jesus came to for you. It doesn't tell us he went to other, any other planet. So, but what he's saying there is that this, this is created. This earth is a one-off production. That's embedded into that word baris, a very special word. Embedded into that word, it means that God has only made this particular one place for mankind, for humanity. So it's very special. But then when you look at Isaiah 43 in verse 7 and verse 21, he uses the word again. He uses the word bara again. And he uses the word bara in context to you as a creation. So basically what God is saying is that when I created the heavens and the earth, it was a one-off creation. But when I created the individual, they were a one-off creation. In other words, God has never created another you. That is good. <laughs> You're warming up, eh? I see you warming up. It's good. So <laughs> God has never created another you. You're a one-off. There's never been another you, and there'll never be another you. Now, what that word means is this. There's seven things that word means, and I won't go into it because of our time. What that word means is this. I'll give you three things that the, the word means. The word bara, God says, when he created you, number one, that you are unique. There will never, ever be another you. Which means that God has never experienced anybody quite like you. The way you pray, the way you worship, the way you trust them. God says, I've never experienced anybody quite like you. You're a complete one-off. So you're a new experience to God. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing to think about that. Amen. God loves you just the way you are and just the way you do it. You might say, well, I don't know other stuff. I don't know the Hebrew. I don't know the Greek. God says, I don't care. I love you the way you are. I love the fact that you'll just come to me and love me. We'll sort, we'll sort out the rest later. 
Amen. And so that's what that word means. It means unique. The second thing that word means is valuable. Embedded into that word means value. In other words, says that you as an individual are valuable to him. In fact, what it actually means is that you are invaluable to God. God places the highest value on your life because he paid the highest price for you. Amen. So you carry the price tag of the Lord Jesus on your head as it were. Amen. You're of incredible value to God. The third thing that that word means, I'm going quickly here because I just want a time of five minutes worship. Third thing that word means is this. It means that you are capable, this is the best part of this whole word, you are capable of transformation. That's what the word means. In other words, it means God says, Tom, the destiny that I have got for you, that I have planned for your life, it is possible for you to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit to become the person that I want you to become. So you're unique, you're valuable, you're capable of transformation. Isn't that powerful? In other words, we're continually being transformed. We're continually being changed. And then I'll just close it with this and then we'll have maybe a time of, of, uh, of worship and we'll just pray over you. Um, the thing that God, God does, God says, you know, all things work together for good. That's where we start to discern. All things work together for good. Another scripture says, uh, I, I love those who love me. God loves, so loved the world, right? So the potential of God's love is for everybody in the world. But then there's people who actually embrace God individually. And God, God says regarding those people, he says, I, I love you. So it, seem, it seems like there's some kind of special love that we discover as we embrace him, as we give him thanks continually. Mark, the message that I carry is worship, giving God thanks continually. Don't stop giving God thanks. Don't stop reading the word so you can effectively praise and do whatever God tells you to do because that is really worship. Worship is actually, and I may do this in the next service, worship is actually not the last slow song that you sung. Worship is the last thing that you did that God told you to do. So God interprets worship in terms of obedience. That may come as a shock to some of you. Most of you get that, which is great. Amen. So that's how God measures it. We measure worship in slow songs. That's okay. But that, biblically, that's not the way God measures it. And I don't have time to give you all the background in that, but just trust me, it's true. The way God measures your worship is what is the last thing that I told you to do? Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Anything you want, I'll just say. Is there a microphone I can sing through? All right. Oh, thank you, Pastor. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What I'm going to do is I want us just to start to thank the Lord. And uh, I want you just to thank Him for the privilege, this is important, of being alive at this time. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It may be a sacrifice of praise. Maybe your circumstances are rough. Maybe things are not going well for your life. Maybe a whole lot of things. But what I'd like you to do is to focus on God right now and not on your circumstances. Let's just do that. And a lot of the time when I, when I, I just start to sing, people start to get healed and people feel the healing power of God in their lives. So I'm going to trust God for that as well. That as we start to worship, that if there's any place in your body where there's, you know, the sickness or disease, I'd like you just to place your hand on that part of your body. And as we start to worship and focus on Him, He will take care of you. But let's focus on Him. Amen. So let's just open our mouths and let's start to worship. Thank you, Jesus. You give life. Yes, Lord. You are love. Yes, Lord. You bring life. 
to just worship him darkness, focus on him right now thank you Jesus every heart thank you that Jesus is worship him great are you Lord great are you Lord come on sing it strong You, Lord. You're great. You're mighty. You're strong. You are healthy. And you bring health to us, Lord. You bring healing, Lord. Father, we thank you right now that every sickness has got to disappear. Every pain has got to go right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, as we worship you, we receive our healing right now. We bless you for it, Father. We praise you for it, Father. Thank you, Jesus. It's your breath in our lives. We pour out our praise. Oh, we love you, Jesus. It's your breath in our lives. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. We pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Thank you for healing, Father. Pain disappearing right now. Thank you, Lord. Great are you, Lord.
we now come to the end of our service. Can we just thank Pastor Tom? Um, we have the, the prayer team are going to make themselves available. If you need any prayer, if there's anything that Pastor Tom talked about, if, if you want uh, a more healing with that body part, uh, you know, that Pastor Tom referred to, the, the, the encounter team is going to be here in front. They just want to pray for you. So if you have any other prayer request, the encounter team is just here to serve you. Um, we've got the Connect Lounge after the, the service. If you're new or you're visiting, uh, we've got people in there who just want to um, um, bless you and get to know you. So uh, check out the Connect Lounge after the service. And don't forget, uh, kids before coffee. Okay? And remember the turtle. You pick up the kids outside. Uh, and that's it for me. Uh, Peace presence in every place. Thank you, everyone.